Isabella Carl, I-S-A-B-E-L-L-A-K-A-R-L-E. Terrific. Now, could you uh, tell us how you happen to become <coughs> part of the Manhattan Project? My husband, Jerome Carl, completed his work for the Ph.D. degree about four months before I completed mine. By the time I had completed my work, he was already ensconced in, at the University of Chicago in the Manhattan Project. He said it was an exciting place to be, but he couldn't tell me why it was exciting. But it seemed prudent for me to go to join him. And since they were willing uh, to hire me at uh, a very reasonable salary for those days, which was, I think, $3,300 a year. Uh, I did indeed start work on the 2nd of January of 1944, I think it is, yes. Uh, at which time I had just passed my 22nd birthday. I worked in a different group than Jerome did. Uh, the objective of the uh, laboratory that uh, Seaborg was ch in charge of was to uh, produce pure plutonium metal. But since the chemistry of plutonium was completely unknown at that time, uh, a number of different paths chemical paths were being tried simultaneously to see uh, what the advantages, disadvantages, or whatever was, and different approaches to making the free metal from the somewhat impure uh, plutonium dioxide, which came from uh, Oak Ridge. The amount of material we had to work with was really uh, quite small. Uh, we picked out our lumps of material from under the microscope. And, as already had been mentioned, uh, research in those days proceeded with equipment that the researcher himself made in the laboratory. My equipment consisted uh, of <clears throat> a vacuum tube apparatus. Uh, which meant that many glass tubes with stopcocks, vacuum stopcocks, uh, were put together and there was a uh, high-powered pump attached to it to remove whatever gases, air, was in the apparatus. And I was, my assignment uh, was to uh, make a plutonium chloride in whichever way I could, in the vapor phase. Uh, there were certain advantages, of course, in working in the vapor phase uh, because it was thought that there would be fewer impurities that would be carried along in the production uh, of the intermediate product. I, I was not making the plutonium, but I was making uh, plutonium chloride or trying to make plutonium chloride in as efficient and uh, clean way as possible. So what that required was for me to make a little apparatus uh, out of silica. Looks like glass, but it melts at a much, much higher temperature. And in order to make uh, this uh, small apparatus in which I would put in the crude plutonium dioxide, uh, I had to do the equivalent of glass blowing, but using a hydrogen flame instead of a gas flame, which was at a much higher temperature. It gave off uh, a lot of blue light, so I had to wear very, very dark purple glasses so as not to damage my eyes in uh, seeing what I was doing. And during graduate school days, I had learned enough about glass blowing that I was able to fashion this instrument, this vessel that I needed. The uh, 
experiment itself had the plutonium dioxide in this vessel, and I was going to pass various gases over it, which were compounds that contained chlorine. But there were other aspects to it uh, that were had to be solved. One is that I would need temperatures of about eight, nine hundred degrees uh, centigrade, which is very high. Oh, uh, and someone suggested in the, amongst my neighbors, <laughs> neighboring uh, uh, chemists and different projects, that the way we could do that is to take a block of copper, to bore a hole through the block of copper, put it around the glass tubes, the silica tubes, and heat it again with a hydrogen flame until the copper turned to be a brilliant pink, an absolutely brilliant pink. And that would be a temperature that I could use I never measured the temperature, but the, I don't remember what the melting point of copper is, but it's uh, a little bit above that. And so uh, with the, a bit of plutonium in the boat with this high temperature, and I evacuated the whole system, after which I inserted uh, various... I used, at different times, various organic compounds like carbon tetrachloride, carbon uh, trichloroethane, and so forth, that uh, would be passed over this hot sample, and presumably the uh, plutonium oxide would then turn to plutonium chloride, and the rest of the materials would be pumped out. I hope that the experiment was somewhat complete because I should describe our laboratory. Our laboratory was a barracks-like building that was built across the street from uh, the uh, uh, Chicago football stadium, the University of Chicago football stadium. Uh, it was a one-story building. We had powerful fans in uh, the cubicles in which we worked that evacuated uh, the air uh, to the outside, directly to the outside. There was a residential neighborhood across the street from that. Uh, I don't know what had happened to the exhaust gases, but they just disappeared into the air. And that was uh, considered, uh, I suppose, a uh, safe enough disposal for us. Apparently it was because all of us who worked around there have survived to our 80s. I always said maybe a little bit of plutonium is good for you, but... <laughs> oh, I was successful in the oh many trials that I did with different uh, organic chlorides. In each case, uh, after the experiment took place, uh, it only took place for a few minutes after uh, I reached a high temperature. Uh, when the apparatus cooled down, it was possible to see that I had some brilliant green crystals with very nice faces. And uh, then I would uh, transfer the uh, crystals in a dry box also a piece of apparatus that uh, all of us in this particular laboratory had built by ourselves. I would crystal, uh, transfer the crystals to uh, dry tubes and carry them over in my pocket to the physics building across the campus. This was uh, winter time. You see, I started working in January. This was maybe March, April. Uh, I would have um, my winter jacket on and just put it in my pocket, literally. And it looked as if I were just walking across the campus. 
And it was not until, I don't know who it was, who, who complained about the insecurity of all of this. My being loose out on campus with uh, this valuable plutonium chloride, the first ever made in this world that nobody had ever seen before. And they thought that uh, I needed a little bit more protection. Well, because I needed to be guarded, uh, I then walked across campus, almost, but not quite, arm in arm, with the two very tall fellows on either side of me. I don't remember if they were armed. They may have been. <laughs> and, of course, that uh, created uh, a bit of a tension, <laughs> because co-eds ordinarily are not escorted that way <laughs> on an uh, academic campus. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were supposed to not take any notes home with us, and our notebooks were always locked in the safe uh, in the secretary's office overnight. The safe uh, being, you know, a big box uh, with a door on the front, and uh, I don't re remember whether it had keys or it was a tumbler safe, I don't remember. But at any rate, one morning the secretary called in that she was very ill. She could not come. She couldn't open the safe. And everybody was standing there scratching their heads. Well, they really needed their notebooks for the day's work. So a screwdriver solved everything. They took the hinges off the safe. Then it swung open. They all took their notebooks out for the day. At the end of the day, the notebooks were put back in. The hinges were reattached, and nobody <laughs> knew the difference. That's great. Um, do you, did, were you uh, aware of any attempts of counter -esp or espionage? Uh, no, I was not aware of uh, anyone ever approaching me or trying to come into our laboratory. There were guards at the, uh, maybe there was only one entrance. There was a guard at the entrance to uh, allow people only with the proper credentials to come into the building. Uh, but then uh, we also uh, attended lectures in the evenings that apprised us of what uh, was going on in the project in the other laboratories around the country. And uh, those were in a different building from that building, and I don't remember any particular security except uh, our pass. There were people, of course, uh, around to see that everybody had a proper pass, but uh, nothing other than that. No one has ever approached me or anybody else that I knew uh, for casual conversations as to what may be going on in the buildings or what we were doing there. When you were working there, was Enrico Fermi there? Or? Yes. Uh, Enrico Fermi was there. He gave many of the uh, lectures that we heard. I think it was every Wednesday evening that we came back to the laboratory to, to hear the lectures, uh, information, whatever, that uh, he had to give about the project. So from the beginning, did you understand what the purpose was? No. No, when I first came, I was absolutely in the dark. Uh, I think I was told that there was a new element discovered beyond the first 92, and that I was going to get some of the oxide and I should make a chloride. I had never had any inorganic chemistry courses in my undergraduate or graduate work, and so that meant that I had to go to various libraries, not only at the University of Chicago, but there was a, a very nice library in downtown Chicago career, perhaps? I don't remember the name. But I would take the uh, the train to town. Everyone to know how to go to the library there. 
And the only information that I had was what I could learn about uranium. Uh, it was assumed that uranium should have at least some similar reactions to plutonium. And yes, that was helpful. They weren't the same. The temperature, the uh, conditions were quite different for making the chlorides. The chlorides had a different formula with plutonium than they did with uranium. But I think that was my only indoctrination. I'm just curious. So when did uh, you become involved in going to these lectures? Anybody could go, anybody involved in this work could go and yes. learn the whole Manhattan Project scope? No, no, they were quite limited in what they told us. So uh, I don't think I even knew about Los Alamos. I knew about uh, Oak Ridge. So what was it like? How many other women scientists were there? I think I was the only one in the whole chemistry area. There may have been some in physics. I did not know the physics people very well. And they were housed mostly in uh, the University of Chicago Physics Building up in the upper floors. But we didn't, didn't have much interaction with them. There were women around who were in uh, various support uh, services. They were the secretarial help and they were laboratory technicians. So how did it feel being one of the only women? Well, it didn't feel much different than being in school where I was <laughs> one of two <laughs> at the University of Michigan in graduate school. What so, prompted you mm -hmm. to choose a field? Uh, that, uh, who encouraged you to do this? My family uh, did not know anything about science. Uh, they had come from Europe, and uh, there was there weren't even any engineers in, in the background. They were mostly country people. Uh, but my both my parents uh, were very hopeful that I would go on to the university. Nobody in the family ever had. In fact, nobody in the family had ever finished high school. And so while I was in high school, <clears throat> the uh, counselors told me, well, you need a science course in order to qualify for a university admission. And the you know, high school offered chemistry, physics, and biology. So I asked my counselor, which one should I choose? I know nothing about them. And she said, well, I don't know either. What about chemistry? All right, that it'd be chemistry. Well, as soon as I attended the chemistry classes, I knew that this was what I was very much interested in. And uh, my parents sort of shrugged their shoulders when I told them I was going to study chemistry at the university. <laughs> and the best, I suppose, that could be done is to say, well, it's something like... Uh, uh, pharmaceutical work, and that, that they understood a bit. You know, there were patent medicines around, but they didn't know why I would be interested in things of that sort. And when I first went off uh, to Wayne State University, I had graduated high school in the middle of the year, and I spent a semester at Wayne State before I went on to the University of Michigan. Uh, my schedule was such that uh, the chemistry course that was convenient for me to take and still catch the streetcar to get back home at a reasonable time happened to be an engineering chemistry course, which I didn't know, and I was the only girl there. But that didn't bother me much, and I, uh, I did get the top score. And, all the examinations, which bothered some of the boys. Not all of them, but some of them. Uh, the uh, professor took an interest in me, and uh, he knew that I was going to go on to the University of Michigan later, and we kept up a correspondence for quite a number of years, and he also acted as an advisor, mentor. So how did you get involved in the 
So um, how did you meet Jerome? I was a senior at the University of Michigan when uh, Jerome had uh, come to the university. He had already had a master's degree in biology from Harvard University. But for a number of reasons, it was not possible for him to continue there, and he decided to change his uh, major to chemistry. And in order to enter the graduate school in chemistry at Michigan, he had to take some undergraduate chemistry, like uh, the fourth year of uh, fifth, which was physical chemistry. And I met him when I walked into the laboratory, the first day of the laboratory instruction, to set up my apparatus. And here was this fellow whom I didn't know, who already had his apparatus all set up, ready to go. And that was quite by luck uh, that I met him because his name started with K, mine with L, and we had our desks assigned in alphabetical order. So I, I think the first words to Jerome was, how did you get this done already? <laughs> and I <laughs> realized this was going to be a competitor. <laughs> But we became friends after a while. So how long was it? Uh, how many years did you spend getting your doctorate? It must have been very fast. It was fast because this was wartime. And uh, the uh, university was being pressured to run the whole year round instead of... Uh, Having four-year courses, the courses would be compressed into three years. Uh, eventually, before the war ended, I also was a uh, instructor in chemistry. That was after I left uh, Chicago, and the only days we had off were Sundays and Christmas Day. Otherwise, the whole university uh, ran on a two and a two-third year. <laughs> basis to hand out degrees. That helped a lot of the students, especially in medical school, to get through medical school early. Graduate school to get through it. Graduate school early so that uh, the young people could go off into their various research projects for the war work or, or other projects that they were slated for. Or the armed forces, depending upon if they had had ROTC training earlier than almost all of those people were then uh, taken immediately to to go into the armed forces. And so uh, I was swept along at the same time at the fast pace. So you were able to get your PhD by the age of 22? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, how did you feel about the dropping of the atomic bomb? It was, one, a surprise when it happened, because by that time we had left the University of Chicago. We no longer were apprised of what was happening. Jerome was uh, then working for the Navy at the University of Michigan, but he was working for the Navy, and I was teaching uh, the freshman courses at the University of Michigan. So it was a great surprise, and it, uh, it was upsetting in many ways, and of course, I didn't know uh, what the circumstances were beyond behind dropping the bomb when it was being dropped and whether there were any negotiations or attempted negotiations beforehand. And I think for many years I was upset about it. How did, um, did the experience of the Manhattan Project um, change your life or make, make you feel about science? or? It was an interlude, not for too long. 
And uh, I don't think it affected me very much at all. I learned some new techniques, but I didn't have much uh, of an opportunity to use them afterwards because I uh, returned to the kind of work that uh, I had prepared myself for in graduate school, and I enjoyed that. And of course, that evolved into various other things, but it, it, it didn't uh, touch uh, the kinds of experiments, the kinds of materials that uh, were involved in the Manhattan Project. In terms of the other people that you worked with mm -hmm. uh, in the Manhattan Project, what were their experiences, if you know? Uh, yes, I know. I, ha I know the experiences of uh, a number of the people. I do have a list of them, knowing where my co-workers had come from who were at the Manhattan Project at the same time I was. They were all very young people. Uh, as you may have heard many times, that the average age of the scientists was something of the 28 years. Pardon? 26. 26 years. <laughs> uh, Uh, the people who worked around me uh, came from industry, from the local universities like the University of Chicago, University of Michigan, and also uh, from California because uh, Glenn Seaborg had brought with him a good many of his uh, students, graduate students, to work on the project. And then there were several from the University of Washington. Uh, I don't know how contact was made with them. But they were either new PhDs, a number of them came from industry and uh, one from a military laboratory from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers who was a botanist who then worked on the plutonium project. Uh, and I was interested in what happened to them afterwards, many years afterwards. And so I had uh, some of them I knew uh, what had happened to them because we kept in touch with each other. Others I had to look up in various uh, compendia. And it surprised me that every single one of these people uh, made a name for himself in various ways. Either uh, as a dean of a school or uh, as a distinguished senior scientist or a professor of biology, for example. <laughs> and I would l like to uh, mention a few of the names and some of the awards that they gathered along the way. Uh, Norman Davidson, who was my project leader, who's a few years older than I, uh, spent his life afterwards uh, at the California Institute of Technology as a professor of biology. And uh, amongst other things, he got the National Medal of Science. Uh, Roy Heath, who had come from industry originally, uh, became the Dean of Graduate Studies at Northern Michigan University. Uh, Joseph Katz uh, had come from the University of Chicago. He was also, I think he was about the oldest one around. He had been born in 1912. I think he's still alive. I see him, have seen him fairly recently at the National Academy of Sciences meetings. Uh, he stayed uh, with Argonne, and uh, he became a distinguished senior scientist at Argonne Laboratory near Chicago. And he was a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, 
And then uh, I should mention Jerome Caro, who got a Nobel Prize in Chemistry eventually. Sidney Cates was uh, <clears throat> one of the Canadians. We had two Canadian citizens who were working with us. There was no problem with being a Canadian citizen as far as security was concerned. He stayed in the United States and he had a research position at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Lyle Jensen became a distinguished professor of protein crystallography at the University of Washington. Winston Manning, who was a co-discoverer of Einsteinium and Fermium in 1952, uh, also stayed at Argonne, and he was one of the managers. One of the people who did something different was Harlan Baumbach. He was a film processor at Paramount Studios. And after the war, I don't remember which years these were, he won two Oscars for scientific achievement in motion pictures. Michael Wolf, who had been a botanist when he had come uh, to the project, went back to work at the United States Department of Agriculture in Peoria, and he was a research leader in cereals. And then there was Alvin Dirksen, really the only one who strayed. Uh, he became a professor of business administration at San Francisco. So you see that uh, of the people whom I knew, most of them, almost all of them, stayed in the sciences. Most of them did very well in uh, achieving some notoriety uh, for their work. Yes. There were various uh, safety features that were instituted mostly by uh, Ed Glenn Seaborg's uh, instigation, pressure. Uh, one of them was that uh, as we arrived at the uh, laboratory every morning, we were each handed a dollar-sized, uh, that is a dollar, coin size, tablet of calcium carbonate flavored with chocolate. And the reason for eating this tablet every day to get our calcium, is to perhaps change the equilibrium in the body sufficiently so that there would be an excess of calcium so that plutonium wouldn't lodge itself in our bones. Happy thought. But apparently uh, there was no problem with the plutonium with, with any of the people whom I had any contact with. Uh, we also had hoods in the laboratory, as I had already mentioned, uh, that exhausted right into the Chicago air atmosphere. But the laboratories were uh, had new air being swept through them all the time. Uh, we uh, had uh, our hands and feet uh, counted under counters to uh, see if there was any radiation uh, coming off from them. And none ever was that I knew of. Uh, and I'm trying to think of other safety features. There must have been a, several others uh, of that nature. But one that was missed uh, happened in an unusual sort of way. Uh, we were not allowed to eat in the laboratory, which was something that was uh, a necessary uh, 
discretion. Uh, so most people either ate their lunches, well, they ate their lunches outdoors, but outdoors wasn't all that good. We went to the local restaurants. Uh, and we came back from lunch, someone was walking down the hall uh, with a counter uh, that immediately went off scale. And this was frightening. So he did it again, and in front of the Coke machine, the counter was just going mad. So apparently the Coke machine in those days uh, was an early version of a Coke machine. Uh, not many of them existed uh, then, in that we had uh, carbonated water uh, coming from one spigot, uh, Coke syrup coming from another spigot, filling a, a paper cup that had dropped from somewhere or other. And after we put in our coin, all these operations went on, and we had a, a cup of paper cup of Coke. Well, immediately, with all the radiation that was obviously around the machine, everybody got very frightened about when did they last drink a Coke? <laughs> the uh, problem was solved uh, fairly soon in that while we were all gone, the man who delivered the Cokes came there every day. He had forgotten to bring his hose in from his truck. And so he was looking around for a hose to use to pour in the Coke syrup from the top of the machine. And he looked into one of the laboratories. This was one of the wet chemistry laboratories. And he saw a hose at the end of what was called an aspirator. Uh, an aspirator is a device whereby if you turn on the water strongly, it uh, goes through the hose and it sort of forms a vacuum behind it and it will evacuate uh, some jars or bottles or whatever that you might need to evacuate. Well, this was used in the wet chemistry laboratory with a plutonium uh, was in solution and, uh, and the chemists there were working with it that way. Well, it was fa fairly highly laced with plutonium and when he used that hose, uh, it washed into the Coke syrup. Well, fortunately, this happened at lunchtime and it was discovered soon enough that uh, apparently nobody had uh, partaken of any of the <laughs> extra laced Coca-Cola. Well, needless to say, the next day, well, the machine was removed immediately. The next day we had a more automated machine that had bottles in it that were already capped at the Coca-Cola plant. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Mm. Um, are there any other experiences or memories that you have of your time in the Manhattan Project mm -hmm. or reflections? It seems that all of us who were working there were very friendly toward each other. I uh, was not aware of much competition amongst the people. And uh, it was a pleasant place to, play, uh, to work as far as the... Uh, personnel was concerned uh, at, at all levels. Uh, most of us didn't know many people in Chicago since we had come from elsewhere, and so uh, our social lives more or less revolved about uh, seeing each other outside of work. When the weather turned better in, in May, we used to go out to the Indiana Dunes or, on the beaches in Chicago. I don't suppose it was an exciting time of life, but uh, it was a busy time because people, uh, some people, depending upon whatever experiments they were working on, just didn't mind working all night long and all day long if the occasion called for it. 
So mm -hmm. uh, what kind of schedule did you have? You said, I guess you had just two days off a year, is that right? That was at the University of Michigan. Oh, oh. Okay. Uh, no, we worked, I don't think we worked Saturdays. I don't remember. But uh, the regular schedule was something from 8 or 9 in the morning till about 5 in the afternoon, unless there were things that needed to be done. Some experiments, of course, uh, he, he, you can't turn off and turn on again the next morning. You have to keep running them for whatever period needs to be done. But so, uh, yes, on paper there was a schedule, but in actuality, people came and went at various times, depending upon the needs of their work. <laughs> so if you could um, talk to young women today, what would you science as a career for a woman? Well, since my day, there have been many young women who have gone into science. Some of them are very successful at it. Some of them have uh, attained uh, positions as heads of departments. Uh, many of them, however, have a problem, and the problem stems mostly from trying to have a family at the same time. That problem has not really been solved well. Some laboratories uh, accommodate women quite well who are pregnant and who want to be on a half-time schedule, let's say, for a period of time or even take some time off. And uh, other institutions frown upon it. Not legally, but they still frown upon it. And so uh, there are problems to be solved. Did you uh, confront those problems? No. It, uh, our oldest daughter was born between the time we left uh, the University of Michigan after World War II and before I started working at the Naval Research Laboratory at San where she was born. Uh, but then five years later, when the next one came along, I worked till a few weeks before she was born, and then I had saved enough sick leave to <laughs> carry me over until <laughs> I came back again to work. And the same with the third one. And we had... Uh, at that time, I suppose an advantage in that many people, younger people, were leaving the farms in the mountains, coming to Washington to work. And they very often had a mother with them who didn't really want to live with their children, mothers who wanted to become independent. And so they became uh, nannies housekeepers, and so forth. And for about 12 years, we had uh, not the same woman. The same woman, I think, stayed for about nine years, and then she got too old, but uh, then several others, uh, who would come live with us five days a week, and then on weekends they would go visit their own families, and that worked out very well. So any of your daughters in science? Uh, two and a half of them. Uh, the eldest one had become a, a physical chemist, and she worked at uh, uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory until recently. The middle one became uh, a pharmaceutical slash organic chemist, and uh, she worked at the NIH for a, a number of years, and then at Walter Reed. Army Institute for Research on Malaria Problems, again until very recently. The youngest one uh, studied geology, and she worked at the Natural History Museum until her second child came, and then child care became difficult recently, and so she's staying home with her until... I suppose, until the children get older. 